Right, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this IES webinar, Casting into the Future of UK Fisheries After Brexit. Today we are joined by speaker Bryce Stewart, who is a marine ecologist and fisheries biologist whose work has ranged across temperate and tropical seas. Bryce gained, gained his BSc in Zoology from the University of Melbourne and a PhD in Marine Biology from James Cook University before moving to the UK in 1999. During today's webinar, Bryce will discuss the future prospects, opportunities and challenges which face the UK fisheries industry and the reform of management approaches as a result of Brexit. As always, there'll be a chance for questions at the end of the presentation, so please do submit these in the Q&A option, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation. I will then ask these at the end on your behalf. Thank you very much for logging in, and I'll now hand over to our speaker, Bryce. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Anthony. So we'll just share my screen. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, obviously, I can't see you, but you can see me. So I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle stop tour of um, Brexit and fisheries today and do my best to sort of cast into the future. This is still a very uncertain sphere, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, and in fact, there's talks going on right as we speak between the EU and the UK about um, the future of fisheries agreement between the two regions. Um, I've, I've had to check the news constantly to make sure nothing had changed before I t gave this talk, but it could change actually while I'm giving it. So who knows? But um, yeah, don't shoot me if that happens. Okay, so uh, the work I'm gonna present today is sort of a combination of about sort of four or five years thinking and research done by you know a whole group of people um, funded by various different places as well the ESRC UK and a changing Europe and I'm also part of this um, group called the Brexit and Environment Network. So one of the first sort of pieces of targeted research I did um, was back in 2017 so sort of six to nine months after the decision to leave the EU um, was we held a, a series of stakeholder events um, at the University of York where we brought together, in this case, about 35 different people from all sorts of different sectors related to fisheries. So we see in a minute that there were commercial fishing representatives, um, recreational, there were seafood processors, there were academics, there were NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. And we got them to all present their views, to fill in questionnaires, to be interviewed. And we sort of combined all this into a report, which was then subsequently released in, in July 2017, and, and then finally written up into a scientific paper. And just to give you a, a sort of overview of what we found, um, I think the most significant thing was this chart, which, which gives you an idea of the different priorities of the different groups. Now, there's a lot going on here. We're not going to try and go through it all. Um, but one thing that was quite encouraging, certainly from my point of view, was that for all of the different groups, commercial fisheries, managers, recreational academics, etc., cetera, um, sustainability was the number one priority across the board. Number four is the top priority. Um, and also sort of strong governance, well-enforced management was pretty much up there for all the groups as well. In comparison, when we look at just the commercial fishermen and what their other top priorities were, this is probably not a huge surprise, but you know, mostly what they were looking for after Brexit was more quota, more control by the EU, uh, by sorry, by the UK um, of the, the UK EEZ. And in particular, there's been a big push for a completely exclusive zone within 12 miles of the UK coast, a better deal for inshore fisheries as well. Um, and, and so, you know, as I said, this is not surprising. Uh, the fishing industry were big backers of Brexit. Um, and one of the main reasons was this sort of perceived idea that, that they were getting a fairly unfair deal in terms of the quota that was being allocated. At the same time, the priority really quite high for both commercial fishermen, but certainly for the seafood processors and suppliers was frictionless trade, you know, access to zero low tariff export markets. 
um, because so much of what the UK catches is exported, particularly to Europe. And so this is where the tension lies, is how can we get more quota, more control, but also keep this um, frictionless trading uh, arrangement going forward? There were some other recommendations which really we took from the report and from the exercise that the stakeholders generally agreed on. And so this was things like giving um, sort of greater voice to people at a local and regional scale, um, particularly inshore fishing communities. So the, the people who are operating small boats under 10 metres, which actually represents three quarters of the UK fishing fleet. Um, Another thing that really came out strongly was the need to, to improve relations between the fishing industry and scientists. And we'll come back to this towards the end. Um, and also, uh, I guess this was more strongly coming from scientists and NGOs, but you know, reminding people that ultimately sustainable and healthy fisheries depend on a, on a, on a healthy marine environment. And so we certainly shouldn't be looking to water down any environmental rules, but in fact, strengthen them and, and make fisheries more resilient into the future. So these are all good ideas, um, but how do we sort of bring all this into reality? And if we just look at this uh, snapshot of headlines, you, you, you again can see where the tensions lie. You know, so not long after um, after Brexit, this is this is in uh, November 2016, you know, free lunch for the EU is over. The UK is going to take back all these British fish, which is a bit of a odd thing to say in, in itself, because so many uh, fish stocks around the UK are shared with Europe, biologically shared over 100 fish stocks. So there was this idea that, you know, there would be this huge boom for the UK fishing industry. Um, but at the same time, and this has been fairly consistent, the European Council have said, yes, I've, we're happy to set up a trade deal um, and have zero tariffs and, and no other restrictions, but reciprocal access to fishing waters and resources should be maintained as it is at present. And the EU have kept this position and maintain it um, to this day. Uh, however, amidst this tension, there was this commitment um, back in October 2019 that, that the two sides would, would somehow use their best endeavours to strike a new fisheries agreement by the 1st of July 2020. Well, that has been and gone um, and we are nowhere near, or well, certainly then we're nowhere near any sort of agreement or deal. And so, you know, we've got this situation where people are talking about doing deals, trading the financial services um, for fishing. I mean, it's very bizarre because fishing is worth a tiny amount to the economy, certainly in terms of, compared to many other industries, but it does punch above its weight. It, 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 it has this kind of iconic status and, and the government um, has certainly been really quite forceful about you know, pushing for a much better deal for their for their fishing industry. And so we have this situation where actually fishing, although it makes up, even when you combine catching and processing sectors, something like 0.12 of a percent of GDP, um, it could threaten the whole trade deal, um, could completely derail it, uh, and we could end up with no deal. So if we had no deal, what would that actually mean? I mean, it would mean all sorts of things for other industries and people. Um, I'm not going to look into that at this stage too much. Um, but, you know, in theory, there could be some advantages. You might think the UK, in terms of fisheries, could do what it wants. It could go ahead and unilaterally set higher quotas for its fishing fleet. Um, but if the EU didn't back down in the face of that, the quotas would be overall set too high for those shared stocks. So, so fisheries would soon become overfished. Everyone would lose out. And of course, um, if there wasn't a trade deal, we would revert to world uh, trade organization arrangements. There would be tariffs in some cases over 20%. And what's really significant are these non-tariff barriers. This is extra admin and paperwork, which would delay the export of, of um, seafood to the EU. And 
<clears throat> that's really significant. The EU is by far the biggest export market. Something like two thirds of, of what is caught here goes to the EU. Um, and the worst affected would be shellfish because this tends to be premium product that's um, exported uh, fresh or in some cases alive. And so if that gets delayed at the border for 24 hours, you know, it, it lose a lot of its value or in fact become worthless in a, in a worst case scenario. So we've got this strange situation, you know, and we're still, we don't know which way things are gonna go. But let's look a bit more detail at some of the science behind these arguments. So one of the big things that the UK government is pushing for is a zonal attachment system to allocate quota to the different fishing fleets. Uh, now, what this means is that um, the allocation of quotas will be based on where fish actually live, in whose economic exclusion zone. And that differs from the current system, which is one called relative stability, um, which is really based on historical patterns of fishing that were worked out in the 1970s. And, and that system hasn't changed since then. Um, so, you know, there's clearly a drive for more quota from the UK fishing industry and the government are behind them. Zonal attachment, as I said, is this new way of, of, of going forwards. Um, but it's not easy, you know, this relies on us knowing where fish live. Um, Famously, uh, uh, one scientist said um, a few years ago, counting fish um, is like counting trees, except uh, the trees are invisible and keep moving around. And, and that's a, so it's a challenging thing. You know, there's always uncertainty when it comes to fish stock assessments. And so that would have to be built in to any sort of system like this. But working with a student of mine, Tamlin Jefferson, and some of my colleagues, we, we attempted to have a look at this using historical data from um, what's called the International Bottom Trawl Surveys. And basically, we produced a series of maps here, and you can see the different countries' um, EEZs. And where there's red areas, that's where there's a high density um, of the fish. And so this particular map is for cod in the North Sea. And you can see it's it's not evenly distributed. There's some real hot spots um, and some other areas where the, the numbers are quite low. So we did this for about 10 different um, major fish stocks. Another example here is monkfish or anglerfish in the Southwest. Again, you can see this really patchy distribution. And then we compared what fish was in the UK EEZ to the proportion of quota that we were given for each of those species. Now, this was a bit surprising. Actually, for quite a lot of stocks, it, was, it wasn't too bad. So if you look at cod in the North Sea here, it's almost spot on. And some of these other fish here, <coughs> um, the amount in the UK EEZ is uh, is shown by the blue bars here. So what, what you're looking for is for them to line up, but there are definitely exceptions. So, you know, hake in the North Sea, um, there's lots more in the UK than we're actually given quota for. And likewise, anglerfish um, down in the, off the southwest of Scotland and Rockall. And there are a number of other examples, particularly in the English Channel, where there is a big disparity. And, and it's certainly fair enough to say that, um, you know, the UK doesn't get a fantastic deal. It did, it did miss out when these arrangements were first set up back in the 1970s and 80s. So this is a loss of earnings, but it also makes it difficult with the landing obligation or the discard ban, because sometimes, say in the case of Hake, fishermen can't avoid catching them. And so this can actually, in theory anyway, cause a whole fishery to, to cut down if they run out of quota for it. Um, but again, this is, this is more complicated. You know, you can look at where the fish are when um, when they are adults or juveniles, but actually when you look at where they were sometimes born, a great example here is, if you can see, is place uh, in the North Sea, which is what each of these maps are. When place spawn, they mostly do this off the mainland European coast. And then as the fish sort of grow and move, uh, 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 they move up into the central North Sea and into British waters, but they were born in France. So if they were people, well, they could get a French passport or actually dual nationality. Maybe you weren't, 
you call them European. So this is all part of the complexity of, of going down this system. So following up this work, uh, we're working with another student, Jordan Cohen. Um, we repeated this exercise of looking at fishermen's priorities after Brexit, um, but just looked at fishermen in this case. Uh, but we divided it up, we got into a bit more detail and we looked at small boat fishermen versus larger boat fishermen. Again, sustainability came out top, which was brilliant, nice to see. Um, An increased share of quotas, again, pretty much at the top. What was, oh yes, and also this exclusive 12 mile zone, but other things, um, interestingly, like, uh, I guess the, the trade came sort of a bit further down the line than I was expecting. Um, and some other things like uh, ecosystem protection was actually quite low. So a little bit different. And certainly there's some interesting differences between the two groups as well. Again, a slightly complicated um, uh, table here, but just to pick out a couple of key results um, and the differences between the two groups. Um, one thing to note is, is who actually said they voted to leave the EU, not as high as some other studies have said. So it's around 70 to 80%, but quite similar between the two groups. Um, down here, it actually, so everyone wants more quota, but when they were asked, would they prefer a zonal attachment approach? There was a lot of uncertainty. So actually, um, you know, in terms of the small boats, 63% said not sure. Um, not many said no in either case, but uh, there, there seems like there's a bit of work to do in terms of communication here. But the other real interesting part of this exercise that we did, we, we surveyed, uh, interviewed fishermen all around the UK for this, is we asked them, what are your specific priorities? Like, where do you actually want extra quota and for what species? And most of the fishermen we talked to said they wanted more and they told us the sort of thing that they wanted. Um, we could have done with a few more Scottish fishermen, but uh, in general, we got some interesting results. Lots of them said they wanted more skates and rays, um, particularly sort of through um, uh, along the West Coast and Southwest. Lack of haddock as well was, um, was highlighted in the English and Bristol Channel. Um, and then things like place and soul again in this channel area. That's that's a really contentious area, as you can see, you know, because France and Belgium is so close, and this is where a lot of the big disparities exist. Um, but this was interesting. They didn't want extra stuff across the board. They were quite specific about what they wanted. So from all of this, my sort of suggestion is rather than going completely towards this zonal attachment system across the board, which certainly as things stand with the EU is not acceptable because it could be quite catastrophic for, um, for their industry in some places, is, is to be strategic, is to, you know, give the British fishermen to focus on the species that are most important to the UK um, fishing industry and the ones that the fishermen themselves actually say they need the most. And in return, some of the other lower value species that the UK doesn't really fish for, the, these are things like horse mackerel, blue whiting, um, uh, sprat, sand eels, etc. You know, let the EU continue with those fisheries and thereby we can reach some sort of a compromise, you know, where both sides come away with um, I guess, you know, their dignity is intact. They can, they can both claim they've had a bit of a victory, which is really the way that most, um, you know, uh, these sort of uh, deals end up being, being reached. So moving on then again to a couple of more specific case studies. And, and here we're looking <clears throat> at the case of inshore fisheries. And this is something that is actually an internal UK issue that, that was used to sort of push for Brexit, but actually is a problem that was generated by the UK itself. The problem is that although small boats under 10 metres make up over 75% of the UK fleet, they actually 
get only three or four percent of the quota. So there, there's this sort of situation where most of the quota for things like cod and haddock and hake and monkfish, etc., go to all the bigger boats. And so the small boats in comparison have had to diversify and they've had to fish for non-quota species. So these are mostly shellfish, um, uh, things like crabs and lobsters and scallops. Um, and, uh, and that, as I said earlier, makes them particularly vulnerable to a no-deal Brexit because of the way that those products are traded. They're mostly exported and they need to be fresh. There's also some questions, Marks, over you know, ownership of quota. It was never meant to be privatized, but sort of almost as, as things have evolved over the last couple of decades, um, quota has become a private entity, you know, whereas fish are actually public property. They should belong to, to the public, to all of the, the UK, but, but as things have turned out, they don't. And so there's definitely an argument to sort of you know, it couldn't be done overnight because people have invested in quota and things like that. But to sort of look at doing things differently after Brexit, Brexit does provide this opportunity to maybe apply more social and environmental criteria to allocating quota in the future, particularly if we manage to gain extra quota um, through the Brexit process and give it to the boats that are more connected to their local communities, that fish in more environmentally sustainable ways that provide more local jobs, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and the work that we did really highlighted the fact that these inshore fisheries have been neglected. So this is just a chart showing if various inshore fish stocks around England had been submitted for um, uh, certification under the Marine Stewardship Council system, whether or not they would be classified as sustainable. And actually, and all the red ones are no. It basically means there's significant challenges to them. And you can see there's only a couple that probably would have passed. And there's lots of reasons for this, um, but you know, it's a combination of lack of science, lack of sort of management and proper control rules. Um, and it just shows that even though these inshore fisheries are so important to coastal communities, and really these are the ones providing most of the jobs, they're actually neglected. So we really need to sort this out. We've got some other strange things going on as well, where there's this division of, of 10 meter boats and over 10 meter boats, and you can really see it here. And this is again, a, a sort of a hangover from historical times when um, the under 10 meter boats were not really regulated, but now they are. And so you've got this kind of high number of boats under this limit, um, and then this cutoff point and a whole different sector going on here. And so it's a, again, it's, a, it's time to sort of look at things and, and take a new approach. So finally, uh, my last sort of case study here from our research is, on trust. And I mentioned this early on that there's a need to improve trust between scientists, managers and the fishermen. If we're going to change the way fisheries are managed, this is fundamental. And what we did again by interviewing fishermen was to get them to, um, I worked with a clever student with a psychology background. He didn't just ask people, do you trust these organizations, but did it in a number of sort of clever ways. Um, and looked at various scientific and management organizations that are listed on the bottom here. Now, for them to pass, they had to score above three. And the only ones who did that were CFAS, so the, the English um, Center for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science. So all of the others effectively failed in this trust score and some did quite poorly. But there's a lot of a lot of range and opinion. So each of these dots actually represents an individual answer. Some dots represent more than one. Um, but you can see how much sort of a range of it look at NGOs, you know, right from no trust at all to actually very high trust. Uh, same for universities, should I say as a uh, university academic. Um, and again, we asked various different things of these fishermen about existing management measures. We actually took this stuff 
from the DEFRA's 25 year environment plan. And we didn't tell people this, but we said, what do you think about these possible management goals? Should we protect more of the seafloor? And lots of people actually said yes, but at the end of the scale, should we increase the number of marine protected areas we have? And that was actually quite negative. In terms of ways we might do this, uh, so increasing the selectivity of fishing gear was strongly favored. But again, marine protected areas and things like putting closed circuit TV on, on um, fishing boats was, was not so popular. So it just really shows where the work is uh, that needs to be done. But one interesting thing that we found in this research was the more that people had worked with scientists, so the more that fishermen said they had worked with scientists, the higher their overall trust in the process was. And so it really highlighted that there's a need for scientists and fishermen to work together much more in the future if we're to bring about some of these innovations in fisheries management. Right, so all of this comes together, all of these possible innovations come together in the, the fisheries bill, which the government has been developing you know, ever since, I guess, Brexit was um, uh, uh, voted for. Um, and this piece of legislation, and again, this is a bit of a complicated slide, but um, it, you know, it was originally produced under Theresa, May, Theresa May's government and then sort of renovated and re-released re in January this year. And it has a combination of high level objectives and then some more specific things. The, the new stuff for this year is the stuff in green, um, and whereas the blue was pretty much there before. Now, when you look at these um, sort of headlines, to be honest, they look really good. I have, for my sins, read this fisheries bill in quite a lot of depth. Um, and, you know, the headline sort of uh, objectives are good. And there's some really, really cool stuff, particularly in the new um, version here where with climate change being brought in. So we need to sort of um, consider the adverse effect of climate change on fishing and aquaculture, but also we need to consider how we're going to adapt our management of these activities due to the effects that climate change have. Now, very few countries around the world are doing this um, and they certainly don't have it as part of their overall strategy. So this kind of, as I said, it looks good, but as is often the case, the devil is in the details. So this is really enabling legislation. Um, and exactly what happens from here is still very much up in the air. So, you know, I've got these, these unanswered questions here. Um, uh, there's talk about these sustainability plans, but it doesn't necessarily say which stocks they'll be applied to if the government will be able to pick and choose. It doesn't really give a firm target for what level they'll be at. Um, is it going to be maximum sustainable yield? What about those inshore fisheries that we don't have good science on? Are we going to get more science there? Um, there's a statement in it that, that management plans will recognize that many fish stocks are shared, but that sounds a bit sort of weak to me, to be honest, recognize over a hundred fish stocks are shared. Um, and uh, it doesn't really sort of go into any depth about, um, you know, how we will sort out disagreements between countries. And this is not just between the UK and the EU, but actually within the UK, um, certain areas, for example, Wales, you could argue under a, um, uh, a zonal attachment approach would be due a lot more quota than they have at the moment. At the moment, the Welsh fishing fleet is almost entirely focused on shellfish. And so the, there's all sorts of potential for arguments and we don't know how they're going to be sorted out. Unfortunately, as well, there was a recent development. Um, this is just a, a last a few weeks ago um, where the House of Lords had voted for sustainability to be the sort of fundamental basis behind the fisheries bill, um, similar to what they have in America, where the, it's a legal requirement to keep their fisheries sustainable. Um, uh, however, the, um, uh, the government voted to remove that because they wanted to be more flexible. And that is certainly a worry from my point of view. And it doesn't even seem to be 
giving the people what they wanted. As I said, you know, sustainability consistently came out as the top priority among the people that we we spoke to, both the representatives and the individual fishermen as well. And of course, we're still in this situation where we don't know whether there's going to be a trade deal or not. Um, the, the, top, the clock is ticking. Uh, this is actually a picture from the talks. Will it be the one that got away? Um, you know, the, the prize catch that we didn't quite manage to bring to the boat? We shall see. I certainly hope some sort of deal can be done because not only in my opinion will be that that be much better economically for the future of the uh, fishing industry it will also help secure environmental sustainability as well so that is all from me a few sort of questions for you to think about a few a uh, few thoughts as well um, lots of people for me to thank my colleagues at the university of york um, but also from a number of other institutes as well. And of course, everyone who committed to those um, comments in, uh, in the workshops and in the surveys and the interviews and everything else. So, yep, that is all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bryce. That was really interesting, really informative and really some really amazing data there on um, priorities uh, and thoughts about how we should move forward post Brexit. Um, if you're happy, we'll now go into a question and answer uh, section. So sure. please, everyone, do enter your questions into using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I've actually got a quick question, if you don't mind, Bryce. Okay. Um, so it was really good from my point of view to see that sustainability was a key priority among UK fishermen from all different types of fleets. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned earlier that one recommendation you received from stakeholders was that was the need to develop partnerships uh, between the fishing industry and scientists. Um, to improve trust, as you mentioned, but also to improve knowledge about stocks yeah. and ecosystems. How do you think this could be achieved and facilitated? So I think, you know, one of, the, one of the big things with the fishing industry is a lot of fishermen are out on the water every day and they're effectively collecting data with every time they put the net in the water or their lines in the water or whatever it is. Um, whereas as somebody like me as a scientist, you know, going on a field trip and collecting data is quite a a difficult and costly exercise. I've got to fill out lots of health and safety forms and all the rest, get the money to do it in the first place. And so, you know, and I do do some of this myself now is, is to work with the fishermen is to develop systems whereby, you know, maybe not everything they're doing, but a selection of their fishing activities can be recorded perhaps electronically. Um, we've been developing cameras that, for example, just focus on the catch and and now there's some sort of neat machine learning technology that you can use to re even recognize species in videos to measure fish or scallops or whatever they are um and i think more of that but it has to be done those sorts of systems have to be developed in collaboration with fishermen because they have to be practical you don't want it so they're slowing down their operations um, they have to be easy to use etc but i think it's definitely the way forward because we'll have much better knowledge, but also, of course, you know, because the industry have been involved in collecting that data, then they're going to trust it more like anybody would. You know, if, 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 if you've seen it with your own eyes, then you're going to believe it much more than than just reading it in a report. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me, definitely. Um, get, and it gives them more ownership over some of the findings that are coming exactly, out. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Great, so I'll just move on to some of the questions that have come in from uh, participants. Um, so the first one here is, is sustainability not com compatible with increasing quota? Could this be an issue for why fishermen failed, uh, are struggling to trust scientists? Uh, and that's because scientists are advising to decrease the quota and closing fisheries. So uh, the fundamental thing here is that the, the UK fishermen's sort of push to increase quota is not to increase the total catch but is to increase the share that the uk gets so say hypothetically at the moment you know you have um i don't know haddock in the north sea and and the uk gets 60 percent of the quota and the eu gets 40 percent. so the uk might say no we think on the basis of this zonal attachment approach we deserve 80 percent and so that is the, where the argument is that they're not wanting to increase it to 150 percent 
Um, they're just wanting more of the share, more of the slice of the pie, because the, the current system, as I said, is in a lot of cases, it's not that fair. And also things have changed, you know, because of climate change, fish distributions have moved, um, boat technology has changed and, and people's tastes have changed sometimes as well. So there is a need to sort of refresh the system for allocating quota. So it's not, yeah, it's not so much about catching more fish altogether. It's just more uh, coming to the UK, basically. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, and you mentioned zonal attachment there, which leads on nicely to the next question. Okay. Um, do you think zonal attachment will work between English and Scottish fisheries? The fleets are very different and how might this work sustainably? Yeah, I mean, that is a really tricky one because as I said, some of the disagreements that are going to arise are not just between the UK and the EU, but you could see it between the devolved nations. And when you're looking at, a, you know, countries sort of so close together, small spatial scales, um, you're going to have fish stocks moving backwards and forwards. So they have this problem, say, um, with the United States and Canada, for example. They have, you know, one of the sort of a horizontal border and, and, and certain species, a lot of species straddle that border. And so you, what you do is you use something like zonal attachment to set the baseline and then you be a bit conservative. So because it doesn't suit anyone to have wild fluctuations in how much quota you're getting every year. You need that to sort of inform the decisions, but not actually to be the ultimate, to, to have the ultimate say in exactly how it's done. Because even then, like I said about the science, the science is not exact. So you, you know, you just couldn't do it. You're going to have to set up a framework and then, uh, and use the science to inform it, but it won't, it, it'll be just one of several factors to, when you're coming up with these agreements. Great, thank you. Um, and actually following on from that, you mentioned um, when you were talking about how fishermen could get involved in, in scientific studies, uh, some new technologies such as machine learning. Mm. Do you think these new technologies will also be useful in terms of making zonal attachment, uh, the data more precise or more accurate? I think yes, because if you have more data, then absolutely you're getting better information on where fish are distributed. And, you know, one of the things, even with, say, for example, the International Bottom Trawl Survey data that we use in our study, you know, it's one of the best such scientific data sets in the world. You know, it goes back to the 1960s, but we found it, even despite that, to be quite patchy. And a lot of the times the scientists although they've been doing this for decades, they'll, they're only going out maybe one or two periods of the year. And so if you, and you, so you can miss things, you know, if there's a, if, if the fish are moving into an area at slightly earlier one year and later the next, then you're going to get very different answers in your surveys. Whereas if you're collecting data more consistently from the fishing fleet, then you're going to get a much better picture. So that is, you know, definitely an argument. But you do have to embrace the technology because, you know, I'm someone who has uh, on occasion, you know, designed research projects either for myself or my students where we set up video cameras underwater and count things. And it's pretty mind numbing after the first 15 minutes, you know. And so to put cameras on every fishing boat uh, and to film everything like that would be just out of control. That would be way too much data, too much information. So you need to be selective. And you need to develop fast, clever ways of processing the information. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so moving on to another participant question. Um, so they say that it's interesting that so many fishing sector stakeholders put sustainability at the, at the top of their priorities. Why do you think the sector has been silent on, or in some cases supportive of, the government stripping out sustainability focused amendments from the fisheries bill in recent weeks? Yeah, I mean, that was a real surprise. I think if I'm completely honest, sustainability means different things to different people. So definitely you would get a different view if you ask Greenpeace versus, you know, a, a North Sea trawler. And I think that's where, that's why the government has done what it's done is because 
it's wanted to remain flexible rather than setting a very um, strict definition like maximum sustainable yield, um, which is what, you know, certainly a lot of NGOs argue for and, and, and a number of scientists, but not all. Um, it wanted to be more flexible and probably to have a broader definition of sustainability. But yeah, but at the same time, there was, there was quite a few people upset, including people from the fishing industry about the government doing that. Um, you know, I've sort of followed the comments on social media and in the news and, you know, there are worries because in the past, we certainly had big problems with um, overfishing around our shores because of, of such a flexible arrangement, you know, when the scientific advice was not really adhered to, which was why the common fisheries policy didn't succeed in its first couple of decades, was it, it, it was just it was too flexible. The approach was was not rigid enough. And so you got to strike that balance. And that's really the, the key to it all. Great. Um, and this is a follow up question, uh, going back to zonal attachment again. Um, yeah. So they've said that stocks are moving with climate change, for example, cod are moving more to the north and North Sea. Um, yeah. And how will this work and how will it affect zonal attachment? Um, again, with a focus on England and Scotland. Yeah, so I mean, this is actually a, a big argument for zonal attachment. Um, because things have changed so much. I mean, like the hake stock that I highlighted in, in one of our studies was was not really present 20 years ago um, in the area where it is. And, and these changes are happening, but you don't wanna be changing your quota shares every year. I mean, this has been, this is another thing that the UK is arguing with the EU about is saying it wants to renegotiate quota shares every year. Well, to do that for a hundred fish stocks is completely impractical. Mm -hmm. So I would personally be saying maybe every five years would be more realistic or 10 even, um, where, because you might see a change one year, but you might not know if it might be just a short-term fluctuation. And these sorts of more significant changes like the cod moving north, like the hake appearing, they, they really don't become totally apparent until you have a bit longer to look at the data. So it's sort of five or 10 year period. And that way you could balance the information with also sort of the need for businesses to have a bit of predictability in what they're doing. So I think that's, that's really the way forward. Okay, thank you, Bryce, and thank you for answering all of those questions. Uh, your presentation was really interesting, so thanks for getting involved. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to stop questions there. Um, attendees, thank you once again for logging in. I hope you found this beneficial and informative. Don't forget to record your attendance at this webinar on the IES CPD tool. You can do this by logging into the members area, uh, and if you have any problems with this, please do get in touch with the project office. Um, this webinar has been recorded uh, and will be made available on the IES website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you'll get a notification every time a new webinar is uploaded. Um, I would also like to mention um, that we are holding our next meeting for our marine and coastal science community uh, on the 12th of November. Details for how to get involved um, are online. Uh, the community provides a forum for like-minded marine and coastal science professionals to come together, discuss topical issues, network and work collaboratively to develop in tailored membership services. So thank you all once again for listening um, and I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Bryce. Thank, thank you. you very much. Cheers Bye. everyone.